dear Professor Ruggi, dear members of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to bid you all a warm welcome and thank you for taking the time to be with us. Above all, I'm grateful to the two institutions that make this even possible, the Graduate Institute for hosting us and De Puri Picte Turetini for its financial support. One can measure the importance of a subject in many ways. A quick and easy one is to check how many entries are associated with it on Google. If you look for business and human rights, you will find in 0.35 seconds about 436 million results. By comparison, labor norms shows 39 million results, not even a tenth. What is the first thing that's come to your mind when I mention business and human rights? It is certainly the automatic association with the most severe human rights abuses, such as torture, execution, rape, and other crime against humanity. If I were to use the Richter scale for earthquakes, also for business and human rights, human rights violation will be ranked today by most people above six, and therefore would raise public outcry, and rightly so. The most important reason, however, is probably the excellent work done by John Ruggie ever since UN Secretary General Kofi Annan invited him to serve as special representative of the UN Secretary General on the issue of human rights, transnational corporations, and other business enterprises. Two of his main achievements are the UN Protect, Respect, and Remedy Frameworks, as well as the Guiding Principle on Business and Human Rights for the Frameworks Implementation. The implementation of his intensive as well as extensive consultation process, his major work, and eventually the endorsement of the UN Rights Council for the result of his work, have made all the difference to issues regarding human rights in business, which were very political and thus easy to avoid for companies, easy to avoid because of the absence of guidelines. The late Sir Geoffrey Candler, a former Shell executive, pointed out since 1990 that multinational company cannot and should not be the moral arbitrators in the world. They cannot usurp the role of governments nor solve all the social problems they are confronted to. But the influence on the global economy is growing and their presence increasingly affects the various societies in which they operate. And what about the acceptability by local population? With this reality come the need to recognize that the ability of multinationals to provide goods and services, as well as to create financial wealth, will depend on their acceptability by a local population which increasingly regards protection of human rights as a condition for the corporate license to operate. Despite the obvious sensitivity of the subject matter, the top management of most companies do not seem to treat business and human rights issues with the same relevance as labor norm and environmental protection issues. This has motivated the foundation to organize today's event. 
The Foundation is deeply engaged in the international corporate responsibility. The spirit of our foundation is to increase the awareness of decision makers that doing right because it is right is the foundation of sustainable corporate success in the long term. Our guidelines for responsible business practices are the 10 principles on the UN Global Compact and the Millennium development goals. For us, respecting human rights in all business-related activities are part of creating values for shareholders and stakeholders in a legitimate manner, and therefore the respectful implementation of human rights in business provide legitimacy to operate locally. I'm confident that Professor Reggie Lecture and the voice of the panelists speak a clear message to raise new corporate attention to the subject and thereby also support the effort of the Swiss administration and NGOs. Thank you for your attention. And now I give the floor to Professor Leisinger, board member of our foundation. Good evening. I'm your moderator this evening, and uh, I hope I can organize the debate as interesting as possible. Before I give the word to Professor Cédric Dupont, I want to quickly tell you how we are going to do things here. <clears throat> John Rocky will speak, uh, will have a lecture on, on the details of uh, the, the Rocky framework, the Respect, Protect, and Remedy one. Then we will have the panel. Every panel uh, panelist will speak about uh, three to five minutes. If it is more, for every new minute, they have volunteered to pay 1,000 Swiss francs to Amnesty International. <laughs> and uh, after, we have, uh, uh, after the panel, we will uh, have first a discussion within the panel and then open up approximately quarter to seven, we will open up to the floor. I wish you a very interesting Afternoon, and I now ask uh, Cédric Dupont, Professor for International Relations and Political Science and Director of the Executive Education Program here because he is our host and we are grateful. Cédric, the floor is yours. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me first address a warm welcome to all of you on the behalf of the Great Institute of International and Development Studies. We are particularly pleased to host this event, given our commitment to engage the world and Switzerland on issues as important as the protection of human rights. The speeches and discussion tonight will surely fit, or at least I hope so, with our deeply entrenched values at the Institute, namely, first, an independent thinking paired with responsibility to a great uh, number of stakeholders, Second, a solidarity of global citizenship. Third, a respect for diversity. And fourth, an aspiration to make a positive contribution in world affairs. Tonight, the discussion focuses on the efforts to have a world without border for human rights. Even though there has been a debate about interpretation of the universality of human rights, it's fair to say that there is a large consensus about the need to protect and respect some core fundamental human rights wherever in the world. The difficult question is, however, has been how to do it. One of the key features of international governance in the last 15 years has been the rise of what political scientists call soft law. Sorry for the lawyers in the room. A set of codes or conducts and standard voluntarily implemented by the actors, both state and non-state actors, in contrast to the binding obligation created by international treaties. Soft law has been a key feature of the governance of many issues, or I would say even most issues, with a very clear focus on the behavior of non-state actors, especially firms, 
in the domain of human and social rights, as well in the domain of the environment. One large advantage of soft law of this new instrument is a much easier adoption by states, given their non-binding nature. As an example, the guiding principle on business and human rights that Professor Ruggie was so instrumental in preparing were endorsed at unanimity by the Human Rights Council in June 2011. What looks good on one side may look bad on the other. What if there is a lack of willingness to voluntarily apply those instruments? Is there a need to combine them with more binding measures adopted by states collectively or individually? This is exactly where we stand on the issue of business in human rights. Indeed, despite the existence of multiple tools that promote the principle of due diligence, in addition to the guiding principle, just to name a few, at the UN level, the Global Compact, adopted in 2000, at the International Labor Organization, ILO level, the Tripartite Declaration on Multinational Enterprise and Social Policy, and at a more focused level at the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the Guidelines for Multinational Enterprise, it is fair to say that there is still much to be done. And for many, this cannot come without some degree of coercion by states. But here again, how and when, given the fierce competition to attract and retain business in a globalized world? In Switzerland, those questions have been on top of the political agenda since 2012 in response to a parliamentary response or motion to prepare a national action plan to promote the implementation of UN Human Rights Council guiding principles. This plan is still in preparation in the offices of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and is those of the Ministry of the Economy. And civil society has become impatient with the slow motion of the process. As a result, a broad coalition of civil society organizations decided to launch a popular initiative called for responsible business that could, if successful, ultimately lead to binding federal legislation. At the same time, as just one example at the international level, Switzerland is facing a complaint in the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg on an alleged lack of adequate judiciary treatment of Nestlé's liability for the death of a Colombian trade unionist working for Nestlé in Colombia. So clearly, there are both domestic and international challenges for Switzerland on this issue, and I hope that discussion tonight will help us better address them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cedric Dupont. If I would introduce John Rocky as a professor in human rights and international affairs at Harvard University Kennedy School of Government and as former UN Secretary General Special Representative of Business and Human Rights, normally that would be enough to grasp an audience's attention and make them curious. However, there's much more to say about John, and uh, this is not a funeral, so I will not talk for an hour, <laughs> but there are two things that I really want to share with you. I have been part of that debate since the very beginning, and it was probably triggered by Mary Robinson when she was uh, in charge of, uh, when she was High Commissioner of Human Rights, but then the atmosphere was totally poisoned. It was a very, very, controversial political debate where the two sides were accusing each other, where the worst examples were taken to prove the whole case, and it was extremely difficult uh, to, you know, to get common ground. Today, due to John's work, it's almost a normal corporate responsibility item. It can be discussed, not in terms yes or no, but how can we implement, how can we make it manageable, how can you be made accountable. The second one is there was a deep rift between some NGOs and some business corporations and poor John had been the man who had to build bridges. You know, the bridge builder, which is the Latin word pontifex. You are not yet pontifex maximus, but who knows? <laughs> he was building all those bridges because at the beginning it was important to get people together and talk. And uh, he has done a masterpiece, and the whole discussion that we are having today is totally different, much more constructive, 
than when it began, let's say, with the draft norms of David Weisbrot in 2003. John, you've done a great job. Here is the floor. Well, thank you very much, um, Klaus, for that wonderful introduction. I wish my, my mother had been here to hear it. <laughs> she might have believed you. <laughs> um, it's good to be back uh, in Geneva. I've, I spent a lot of time here, not only because the Human Rights Council is here, but uh, because um, I have um, good friends that I come visit regularly. Uh, little did I anticipate that I was going to be staying for a while this time because of the uh, Worst blizzard in the history of the United States. I can't get back home for a few days. Um, so uh, it's a special um, privilege to be here at this uh, fabulous installation. As someone from the Kennedy School, I'm absolutely jealous um, at, 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 at this terrific auditorium. I wish we had one just like it. Um, I'm, because this is in part an academic audience, I'm, I'm going to sneak in a few academic thoughts. Um, but um, um, overall, it'll be the story uh, that, that Klaus um, suggested um, of, the, uh, of the guiding principles and how, how, they, how they came to be, what they mean, what the, what the strategy was, and, and where they are today. And if I can find the clicker, and I think this is probably it. Um, I'll carry on. Now, we don't need a big introduction into, into what we're talking about here. We're talking about basic human rights, whether it has to do with the behavior of security forces that are protecting the assets of, uh, uh, of, of, of mining or oil installations. We're talking about issues related to the displacement of, of communities, um, where, uh, indigenous people's rights, um, land grabs. We're talking about um, the impact of uh, companies on the livelihood and health um, uh, of people, which affects uh, human rights. We're talking about the Rana Plazas of the world. And the question really was, um, what from, a, from the point of view of, of a global platform uh, like the United Nations, what, what's, the, what's the best strategy that one could hope to, to follow? If I, if I push this, will something happen? No? No? I got the wrong one? Yeah. Thank you. No? So I'll, I'll use the keyboard if that works, but that doesn't work either. Okay. What would you like me to do? <laughs> that, should, that should work in a second, but let me I can do a little dance routine. <laughs> you keep talking. talking. Okay. We'll I, figure it out. All right. I keep talking, except that the next thing was going to be. Um, a timeline that I wanted to show you of, of how these things, um, that isn't right either, okay. Um, a timeline that, uh, that I wanted to show you, as Klaus said, um, prior to uh, 2005, uh, the debate had certainly been lively, uh, but uh, it was also highly contested and deeply divisive. Um, a subcommission of the UN Human Rights Commission took it upon itself to draft something called the norms on transnational corporations um, and uh, other business enterprises um, in virtual seclusion, um, certainly with no business involvement, very little government involvement. Um, and um, when they presented it to governments, governments said, no, thank you, um, and asked the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. <laughs> ah, there we go. What do I do? Which one? This one, just go to the right. To the right, okay, thank you. Uh, ask the Secretary General of the United Nations uh, to appoint a special representative uh, to start the process all over again and hopefully um, um, lead to greater success. And, and I happened to be standing nearby and, and, and as a result got stuck with the job. Um, so that was in 2005. Um, uh, one of the things, it, it, it was an unusual mandate, um, if I may say so, because um, I wasn't asked to do anything much. Um, it reminded me once when I was um, uh, at Columbia University, this was back in the divestment from South Africa days, 
And the president of the university called me in and said, I want you to chair a committee um, on divestment. And then the whole committee was sitting there and he told the committee what he wanted and I didn't understand a word he said. And so when it was over, um, I said, can I have a word with you privately? And he said, sure. And I said, so what exactly do you want me to do? And he said, not much and do it slowly. <laughs> And my mandate from the UN wasn't, wasn't radically different. Um, I was asked to clarify and identify things. Right? Um, what do we mean by corporate responsibility? What do we mean by corporate complicity? What is a corporate sphere of influence? And so on and so forth. Um, and, um, and I was asked to make recommendations uh, at the end of it all. So it was a three-year mandate. At the end, I decided that I was only going to make one recommendation uh, because I was worried that they would get lost among the trees and not see the forest. And so I said, look, I've developed this framework that consists of three fundamental pillars. States have a duty to protect, companies have a responsibility to respect, and rights holders have a right to remedy. Do you agree? And they said, yes, the, we agree. Uh, now take another three years and operationalize this. <laughs> and I, I had no idea what operationalize meant, but I came up with the guiding principles as my response because they didn't know what they meant either. And so I figured they can't very well turn, uh, uh, complain about ter uh, coming up with guiding principles if they said go and operationalize. So that happened in 2011, um, 31 principles, um, along those three pillars, which I'll get back to in a second. And for the first time in history, um, the UN human rights machinery endorsed a normative text that governments did not negotiate themselves. And I think the reason for that was pretty clear because they could never have negotiated it. Um, it, 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 would have, it would have ended up with such a low common denominator that it would have been meaningless. Um, since 2012, there's been convergence and implementation, which I'll talk about, not as fast and not as far um, as, as some of us would like. And then just last, excuse me, just last year, uh, a proposal has come up from a number of countries to actually um, um, negotiate a binding um, uh, legal um, instrument um, on business and human rights. That's sort of the, the overall uh, timeline. In 2011, when I came up with the guiding principles, I categorically rejected the distinction between mandatory and voluntary. I said, I've, 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 never, I've never seen a society in human history that relies on voluntarism alone. And most of the societies that we have seen that rely only on command and control regulation have collapsed. So what we really need is a, is a smart mix of measures um, in order to move this agenda forward. And that's been sort of my, um, if you will, my slogan um, ever since. Now here, it, it's, this is a sort of a semi-academic idea, but it also has tremendous policy relevance. When I looked out at the world of corporate conduct, I, I, I saw that corporate conduct is in fact governed by three different governance systems. The first one is the traditional system of public governance. The, what, what governments do individually and collectively. They legislate, they regulate, um, they devise international law, they sign international treaties and all the rest of it. And we also know from observations that governments by themselves have been either unable or unwilling to do all the heavy lifting by themselves that needs to be done. And so gradually there has emerged, secondly, what I would call a, a world of civil governance. Civil governance meaning um, the organization of civil society, whether it's communities or NGOs or what have you, that operate through social compliance mechanisms, right? They run campaigns. Um, they sue companies. Others form partnerships with companies in order to improve behavior. But it is so well institutionalized today that um, I called it um, a system of governance in its own right. 
The third, of course, is the system of, go of corporate governance, what, how, how, gov how corporations govern their own affairs. Uh, now, we have a fundamental issue um, in that multinational corporations are barely recognized in international law. Why? Because of the uh, doctrine of separate legal personality of the individual entities. So if uh, Shell Nigeria does something um, 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 uh, in Nigeria, the most plausible uh, entity to sue is Shell Nigeria, not the Shell Group. The Shell Group is a, 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 an economic reality, right? But Shell is made up of, I don't know how many dozens of separate legal entities that, to be sure, are directed by the economic entity called Shell, but the economic entity called the Shell Group is not a legal entity as such. It's a bundle of contracts, a bundle of separate contracts. Um, and I noticed that the, the, the idea of separate legal personality comes up all the time um, in terms of defending against accusations, but yet companies engage routinely in enterprise-wide strategies, targets, um, and, and risk management systems. Okay, so the observation was there are three separate governance systems, unequal to be sure in terms of their weight, in terms of their power, but the challenge was how to, how to align those three governance systems more effectively behind a common normative framework and policy guidance so that they begin to push in the same direction as opposed to contradicting each other. Okay, that's sort of the, 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 most, the most basic thought um, behind the guiding principles. To do that, and this was not without controversy, to do that, I actually drew on the, the if you will, the different modes of discourse, uh, the different rationales um, that go along with these three governance systems. So for states, um, the emphasis was on legal obligations, right? States have legal obligations under international human rights law, and those legal obligations include the duty to protect against human rights abuses by third parties, which include business, at least within their jurisdiction, and in a very limited way, extraterritorially. A completely different rationale for business. For business, in addition to complying with legal obligations, the guiding principles focused on the need to manage the risk of involvement uh, in human rights um, abuses, which requires that firms act with due diligence to avoid, to mitigate, and if bad things do happen, to remedy. For affected individuals and communities, it invoked the right to remedy. So you see three different rationales the attempt to um, combine them or, 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 or align them, I should say, behind um, a um, common uh, set of guiding principles. So protect, respect, remedy. The state duty to protect, the corporate responsibility to respect, uh, and greater access to effective remedy on the part of those who are harmed. 31 principles, they spell out the meaning of the three pillars for law, policy, and practices. They apply to all businesses, um, all internationally um, recognized rights. They are a soft law instrument, uh, if you will, even though, as I'll mention in a moment, um, quite a number of elements have already been translated into national um, policy requirements and national legal uh, requirements um, with um, punishment for non-compliance. So let me focus now on the business part rather than the government part for the remainder of, of, of what I'm going to say here. So the what for business. What, is, what, is, what are we asking business um, in, the, in the context of the UN guiding principles? We're asking business to avoid causing or contributing to adverse human rights abuses, not only through their own activities, um, but also through their business relationships, through supply chains, 
through their relationships with government security forces, through their relationships with governments for that matter, uh, and to address such impacts when they occur, and to seek to prevent or mitigate impacts that are linked to their um, operations. The how for business. How do you go about preventing harm to people if you are business subject to the corporate responsibility to respect? Well, first of all, it requires impact assessments, if you will. As assess the impact that a mining operation is going to have on surrounding communities. What's it going to do to the, literally, physically, to the communities themselves? Do they have to be moved? What are the rules about moving people? Um, what is, what, what's it going to do to the water supply? Um, what's it going to do to uh, employment um, um, opportunities for artisanal miners, for example, um, or, or people who make a living out of fishing in streams? Um, evaluating the severity of those impacts and then prioritizing those for immediate uh, attention. Secondly, to act on what you find, to incorporate those findings across all business functions. Business and human rights is not a separate department in a company. It cuts across all business functions. It cuts across the operational function, the transportation function, the procurement function, the transportation function. They all impact human rights. And so incorporating findings um, uh, across the, the board um, is extremely important. Third, building leverage. Um, I've, I've worked with a number of companies who have told me that their biggest challenge is to build leverage internally. That to get the attention, okay, so you're, you're a gold mining company. The price of gold is soaring. You want to get the stuff out of the ground as fast as possible, right? You're the operations person. The community relations person is saying, wait a minute, um, we have not done adequate consultation with the community. You have a conflict between two branches of the same company, the operations people and the community relations people in this particular example. Building leverage of the community relations people internally is in itself an important challenge. Um, and our involvement of those people um, in our process uh, was an attempt to help build leverage. Prevent and mitigate, obviously, and then remedy um, actual impact. There's an old saying, which um, is probably mostly true, that what you can't measure, you can't manage. And so you need to develop metrics. Um, and, and companies that have taken this seriously um, I'll take a non-Swiss company for an example, Unilever, um, have developed exhaustive, extensive metrics measuring every aspect of uh, what we're talking about here, uh, and also measuring the effectiveness of their policies. Um, and it becomes part of management routine. Um, and then, of course, um, you don't keep all of that to yourself. You inform those who are affected in particular uh, and engage them, um, and you um, report uh, more broadly. That's the how for business. The how for business is organized around the idea of human rights due diligence, a concept that we um, introduced and elaborated. And uh, I must say um, that businesses um, have responded to very positively because due diligence is something that they understand, um, even though they might not have understood it in the context of human rights, due diligence is part of um, risk management for companies. So you point out, what are the high risk factors? Well, um, be, look at your, carefully the nature of your business. Who, who are you doing business with? Do you, do you know your customer, as I say, in the banking business, right? Um, who, who, who are you dealing with? Are you dealing with, um, with, with armed factions? Um, you, know, you know the, the, the case um, of Chiquita Bananas uh, that has been accused of paying off both the FARC and the paramilitaries um, uh, in Colombia 
at, um, at different times in order to provide protection um, for their assets. Um, the, both of them happen to have been uh, classified as terrorist organizations under American law, uh, which was not a good thing for Chiquita, and it certainly wasn't a good thing for the several thousand people who got killed um, by these security forces. Uh, and the company claimed, well, we, were, we, we, didn't really, we didn't really know. I mean, we're, we were just hiring somebody to protect our assets. Uh, the nature of the operating context. If you're operating in Denmark, it's not quite the same as if you're operating in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and you need a heightened due diligence process if you're operating uh, in the latter. That may not be necessary uh, in the former. The nature of the business activity itself, um, it, it obviously is important because of, of, uh, of, of the particular pressures and, and the particular rights that it impacts. Um, and then there are vulnerable, vulnerable groups such as indigenous groups, um, for example, um, that need um, special attention. So once you've done that, this, this, is, this is obviously very simplified. So you list your business activities, you know, you're, 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 you're digging the stuff out of the ground, the, 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 the transportation, um, the procurement, whatever it is. Um, down on, on, the, on, the, on the vertical axis and across, you list the different stakeholders and then you see what goes in the various boxes. It isn't rocket science. Um, and for any given company, it's much more complicated. Uh, but this is a, a sort of a visual representation of how you begin to identify impacts uh, that need, uh, excuse me, that need uh, responses. And on the basis of that, this is very common, as, as, as Klaus will tell you. Uh, risk maps are, it's, it's, a, it's a routine thing. What's unusual about this risk, math, math, uh, math, uh, risk heat map is that the risk here is not simply to the company, it's to people. So the severity of the risk, right, may go with a very low likelihood of the risk occurring. Now, if a company confronts, typically in a business context, a low risk, high impact, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna suggest that the, low, that the low probability always wins out, uh, but the chances are that it's going to be weighted more heavily, the low probability than the high risk. This is high risk to people, and that's why the red goes all the way across the top. It requires a different mode of thinking about uh, risk and impact. So what are the implications of this? Well, we've spelled it out. If an impact is caused by a business, if you, you are responsible yourself for hiring child labor, um, you obviously you fix the problem, you remediate the problem, you, you, you don't do it anymore. You take steps to prevent its continuation. What if you didn't cause it, but you contributed to it? How do you contribute to it? Well, um, Steve, Steve Jobs, before um, uh, the iPhone 5, I believe it was, came out, placed a massive order with Foxconn. Uh, very short timeline, very, very tight price controls. And about four weeks or so before it was due, he said, you know what? I don't like the, the glass on the screen. I want it changed. He didn't change the delivery date, and he didn't change how much he was willing to pay for it. Okay? So almost by definition, Apple knew that it was impossible to meet this demand without violating labor standards. That's what contributing to means. You didn't cause it, but you contributed to it. Um, so when you contribute to it, you take steps to prevent its continuation, and you use whatever leverage you have um, uh, in order to do that. Um, you, you yourself change your behavior. And by the way, talking about supply chains and supply chain monitoring, the one aspect of it that we rarely talk about is responsible buying. 
the responsibility of the buyer. We're always focusing on the responsibility of the factory in which things are produced or the country in which it's produced. We rarely focus on the, responsible, uh, the responsibility of the buyer. Uh, and that's an important part of the guiding principles. The third possibility that we outlined is that you, you may not have either caused or contributed to, but you're, you are associated with a human rights abuse because you source from the same factory even though in this particular case it wasn't producing your goods. So the point of this is that the, the type of responsibility, the level of responsibility is differentiated depending on the degree of involvement of the business. And this is again something that business found useful because business doesn't believe that it ought to be either blamed for everything or considered the source of all solutions. And so a, a gradation of responsibility was of critical importance for uptake of the guiding principles by the business community itself. Now we come to remediation. Um, the guiding principles, here's a confession, the guiding principles like every NGO report I've ever read on the subject are much weaker on judicial remedy than they are on non-judicial remedy. And the reason is very simple. Judicial remedy, fi fixing judicial, lack of judicial remedy is very hard. Judicial reform takes a long time. Um, we identified what some of the obstacles are, some of the practical and doctrinal obstacles to judicial reform. Um, and and, and uh, a project is still being carried on by the office of the UN High Commissioner. Um, on identifying and dealing with um, some of those obstacles. But in the meantime, there are lots and lots of alternative dispute resolution techniques that typically had not been used in the business and human rights field. Some of them can be state-based. The OECD guidelines have the national contact points that can be used to bring complaints. But we actually did a bunch of pilot studies um, on um, companies with um, uh, communities um, and external experts setting up their own grievance mechanisms. Um, this occurred to me, um, this idea occurred to me um, actually um, in, when I was visiting Cajamarca in Peru. Um, the local, uh, a local community um, leader, uh, Father Aranya uh, was his name, or still is his name, um, had been organizing protests against Newmont Mining. Um, a major um, um, uh, copper and gold operation uh, in Yanacocha uh, nearby. Um, and um, they had m managed to close down all of the access roads to the mine. Nobody could get in, nobody could get out. Food had to be helicoptered in so that the people inside had something to eat. Um, the police were eventually called out. <clears throat> um, shots were fired and y you know the rest of the story, right? Um, People were hurt, some people were killed. I met with um, Father Arana and I, I said, um, um, what, what brought you to this point? And I'll never forget the answer. He said, they didn't listen to us when we came with small problems, so we had to create a big one. And I said to myself, what an incentive to put, what, 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 what are they thinking? They come with small problems, you deal with the bloody small problems before they escalate into a big problem. And that's what grievance mechanisms at the local level are very good at. Um, because, you know, um, the, the, the crisis of Shell in Nigeria didn't begin with the execution of Ken Saravivo. That was the culmination, right? The problems had been going on for 20 years and had been ignored. And I remember Mark Moody Stewart, who was chairman of Shell, saying when the guiding principles were rolled out, saying, I wish we'd had these 20 years ago, it would have saved lives and it would have saved us a lot of trouble. <laughs> so um, we, we focused on non-judicial grievance mechanisms, not because judicial grievance mechanisms aren't important, but we, we didn't have the fix for them either, but we did have contributions to make um, on the non-judicial. Non um, so 
once it became clear that these guiding principles had resonance, that they enjoyed widespread stakeholder support and were likely to get endorsed by the UN um, Human Rights Council, um, I, I literally began a campaign, right, to sell them to other state, to other international standard setting bodies. Um, I went to the OECD, I went to the European Union, I went to ISO, and I, I went to the International Finance Corporation. Um, and um, gradually, um, the OECD took the, the, the uh, responsibility to protect chapter literally out of the guiding principles and it, it adopted them in their own 2011 revision uh, of the OECD guidelines. Um, others took elements of them, uh, but as you see, gradually they've drifted beyond the North, um, African Union, Organization of American States, ASEAN, um, and so on and so forth, and um, they've drifted in some respects into national legislation, uh, or in the case of the EU, EU-wide uh, legislation. Sorry about the formatting there. Um, the whole idea of the due diligence requirement um, in Dodd-Frank, um, I'm told by people who pushed for the legislation, was inspired by the, due, by the, by the idea of human rights due diligence that came out of um, our work. Um, in the United States, there's, a now, there's now a mandatory reporting requirement. Any American individual or company that invests more than $500,000 uh, in, in Myanmar uh, is required to report um, on impact, including human rights, and the guiding principles are the benchmarks against which the reporting takes place. Uh, the EU, as you know, has, um, uh, in, has adopted non-financial reporting requirements uh, and minerals regulations, and they explicitly include human rights and also point to the uh, guiding uh, principles. Uh, China, um, uh, to the surprise of many people, is actually uh, in, in many instances adopting parallel standards for their overseas, um, uh, some of their overseas operations, particularly in mining. A number of countries are developing um, comprehensive national action plans for how to implement the guiding principles. Um, and the last one that I put, put on here, it, this actually just happened a few weeks ago, um, and, and, and un unfortunately there's only one example, I wish there were more, but the Canadian government has now said that um, here, are the, here are our expectations for when, for when our mining industry operates overseas and we provide support for that investment through export credit, for example, and you don't comply with those standards, you get no more export credits. And don't bother coming to the consulate for help, you're not gonna get it. You either comply and you have our help or you don't comply and you know, don't, don't call us and we won't call you. And, um, endorsement and alignment by uh, major international business associations uh, incorporated into the Global Compact. Um, individual companies, including Swiss companies, um, have announced that they are aligning their practices with the guiding principles. The last one is particularly interesting. and, and um, it, I, I wish I could claim more credit for it than I can. Um, the American Bar Association decided that they were going to endorse the guiding principles for law firms. The law firms are businesses, and law firms advise businesses. Why should they be exempt from... And so that triggered the International Bar Association from doing the same thing and now actually issuing guidance to law firms on what this means. 40 pages long, just come came out a couple of months ago. Uh, you can look it up on the uh, internet. So gradually, not fast enough and not far enough, the guiding principles are becoming um, a part of what I would call the regulatory ecosystem for uh, business and human rights. Okay, very quickly. Um, in June of last year, a number of countries introduced a resolution in the Human Rights um, Council saying this is all well and good, but we need an international treaty because it's binding. And, and forgive me for saying this, but 
the word binding has a certain mesmerizing effect on people. Now, there's now a good 15 years of serious research on the effectiveness of human rights treaties, okay? Um, and it's mixed. <laughs> Let me just leave it at that. The evidence is mixed. So the mesmerizing effect of binding isn't all that it's made out to be. But what's worse about this particular proposal, which was made by Ecuador, supported by Cuba, Venezuela, and Bolivia, um, is that it essentially would start the process all over again. Um, and and, 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 and it, uh, the, United, the, United, the US and the European Union um, announced at this council meeting um, we're not going to participate in this negotiation. Um, this undermines what we've been trying to do for three years. Um, the, the time is not right. My objection to it is different. My objection is that it is humanly impossible. And I, th this is a big claim, so um, I hope there's a back door out of here. Um, <laughs> It is humanly impossible to try to shoehorn, to, to try to squeeze all of business and human rights into a single international treaty instrument. It is far too complex, it is tar, far too conflicted, far too many bodies of law are involved that would have to be rewritten in order to comply with a business and human rights treaty that would impose human rights criteria on every other body of law that affects corporate behavior. That's not going to happen, it can't happen. Uh, it would have to be cast at such a high level of generality that it would be of no use to real people in real places. And the last thing that the world needs is, in my view, another symbolic gesture that makes promises that can't be kept. And this would make a promise that can't be kept. So I'm not against treaties. My argument has been focus on particular governance gaps, right? Uh, there are real governance gaps, particularly in judicial remedy. Focus on them and see if you can make progress on a treaty in that, rather than trying to write a global constitution for business um, under international human rights law. I'm almost done, but I was asked to um, say a few words about leadership opportunities for Switzerland. And I also added some leadership opportunities for the Fondation Gouillet, the, the, free of charge. <laughs> <laughs> Switzerland um, was very supportive of the UN mandate from, from the start. When Claude Wild was um, a chair of the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights, he did a terrific job. Thank you, Claude. Um, and I, obviously, Swiss society takes these issues very seriously, as you, hear, as, as you heard before. Not only uh, companies doing things, but uh, popular initiatives um, going forward. Um, but I asked myself the question, um, is there a particular comparative advantage that, Sweden, uh, that Switzerland has that other countries don't have? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, that Switzerland has that other countries don't have um, to the same extent where they could really take a leadership position where they're not necessarily taking a leadership position now. Commodity trading companies, number one. You are the, 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 the home of the leaders of the commodity trading business. It is one of the most opaque businesses in the world. We don't know much of what goes on there because very little of it is reported. Um, Professor Piat, who's um, a, a very respectable person, I've met him personally, said, you know, it's not intrinsically bad, we just, we just don't know what's going on and that in itself poses a risk. So I would certainly um, put that uh, on my list. And, and, and guess what? <laughs> Number two, banking. You know, you know uh, I read a book recently. It's called The Offshore World. It's about the origins of the concept of offshoring. Um, um, and, and, and Switzerland features in it because of some of its banking regulations uh, that you, know, you, can, you don't have to be 
in Switzerland or, or, or be a Swiss to have a Swiss bank account and all the rest of it. Anyway, um, it says in there, I don't know if it's true or not, that Switzerland has more banks than dentists. <laughs> now, if that's true, you've got a comparative advantage here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, but the good news is that there is a group of banks, including two Swiss banks, that actually have taken the time to study the UN guiding principles and try to figure out what they mean for banks in all their functions, um, retail banking, investment banking, all the rest of it. Uh, and it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a very useful document, uh, and it can be built upon um, if Switzerland is looking for um, opportunities uh, to exercise uh, leadership where others aren't because not much is being done on banking. And, and banks are different, right? They're not like a mining company that digs stuff out of the ground. Um, they're a step removed. But what is their responsibility as an entity that's a step removed? Is it none? Is it all? Or is it some? And there are real questions about that. Um, and um, it would be an interesting Conversation. The third one is, 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 is not as controversial, but there are many uh, Swiss uh, small and medium-sized enterprises that actually do international business. And, and the fact is that most of the work that is done on social responsibility, and you'll agree, I think, Klaus, is done for large companies. Um, and we haven't, we haven't figured out how to, how to scale down, as it were, uh, to small and medium-sized um, enterprises. So um, you asked, what did I think some opportunities might be for Switzerland? There you go. I got, I got three. Now, the Fondation Guillet itself. Um, this is from, from your website. Um, you're convinced that corporate extra financial reporting is the driver of change externally as well as internally. Uh, do I have a deal for you? <laughs> um, the European Union, as you know, um, has now adopted a directive requiring non-financial reporting. My suspicion is that sooner or later Switzerland is going to follow that directive as it does so many other EU directives that relate to this, right? Uh, however, um, uh, and other countries are, are, are doing the same thing. The US has, has requirements, stock markets have requirements but there's no guidance on precisely what or how to report, especially how. Um, when I stopped my uh, being special representative um, for uh, business and human rights, um, I became chair of a nonprofit that my team, my former UN, my former UN team started uh, called SHIFT. Um, SHIFT is working with Mazars, the French accounting and consulting firm, and they actually have developed, um, through multi-stakeholder process, uh, reporting requirements that are based on the UN guiding principles, uh, genuinely based on the UN guiding principles. Um, Unilever has, has agreed to begin um, um, a, a pilot project. Um, we need other companies to step forward and participate in the pilot project. Um, and we also need help. Um, in funding some of the costs. So that's the free advice. Give us some money. <laughs> it's the next big thing. So what I've tried to suggest here is it's been a trajectory. It's been a journey. It's not a destination. It never will be a destination because the expectations of society change. They increase. Things that were once acceptable aren't acceptable at some point in the future. But this journey, in my view, um, in the last um, six or seven years, um, has not ended all business in human rights challenges by any means, but as I said to the Human Rights Council, um, it does mark the end of the beginning because for the first time we have a common framework, uh, a common framework endorsed by all stakeholder groups, including states, businesses, uh, and many civil society organizations, a common framework on which to build. Thank you very much.
I don't. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, John, for this excellent introduction, and uh, thank you for the food for thought. Now, speaking of food for thought, John said he wished his mother were here. <coughs> that uh, brings me to a point. My mother told me, Klaus, if you did something wrong, admit it immediately and apologize. One of the most important human rights categories is diversity and discrimination. And while nearly half of the audience is female, the panel is not exactly gender correct. All men and all not that young. <laughs> so I do apologize uh, and I promise a next time that will be different. So that brings me to the panel and uh, I want to ask the members of the panel to come up and sit here while I'm introducing them. Let me start uh, with uh, Claude uh, Wilt. Claude is uh, the head of the Human Security Division of the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. Peter Nikli is the CEO of the Alliance Sud, an alliance of the most important Swiss development NGOs with the, with the mission to lobby for a Swiss North-South policy that is in favor of the world's poor. Matthias Leisinger, who is not member of my family, so there is more than one Leisinger around Matthias. He, <coughs> Matthias is head of corporate responsibility for the travel company uh, Corny. We have Robin Cornelius, who is the founder of a very interesting company, and I'm sure he will talk about that. It's the product DNA company that uh, has uh, introduced traceability with regard to all aspects of production. And if you look uh, for Robin on Wikipedia, he is called to be a rock star of the Swiss textile companies. So if you want to sing, you're welcome. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Stefan Graber, General Secretary of the Trading and Shipping Organization. It's about six o'clock now. We have one hour to go. And I have asked every member uh, of the panel to make a short introductionary <coughs> Uh, remark uh, on the question, you know, can Switzerland make a difference and if yes, how? And I really would be grateful if you would stick to the three minutes because then we have more time for discussion and I want to invite the audience also to participate. May I start with you, Robin, Rockstars first, uh, with your um, introduction. Uh, thank you, Klaus. I'm organized. I can buy time, right? You what? I can buy time. Yes. I took my what, credit 1, card. 1,000 uh, 1, Swiss francs per minute to Amnesty it. International. Okay, I will keep yes. it. Okay. Uh, I just and it to... doubles every second minute. Okay. <laughs> You're stealing me 15 seconds now. Okay, I just want to say, um, when I started business school and uh, political sciences in Lausanne, I learned in business school about marketing, finance, cash, and so and political sciences about vision, about taking time with great professors. And after 30 years, 33 years in textile, what is missing is not in economy politic, but in politic economy, uh, in politic economic. You have on the left brain, you have the, the, the doers, you have the finance, sorry, the finance guys, and you have the on the right brand, you have the marketing. Everything goes about money. Money, money, money. And I have some notes, but I'm not going to use it there for you, Ruggie. If I met you long, uh, earlier as your assistant, we would have done marvelous things together. I swear you will see it. Because so many things I wrote down, different eyes, OK? I would take it after later. So just, I get one minute more. So after 30 years doing business, textile, this, for instance, I said, how can we trace, and my colleague helped me, to put on a code and to tell people how the goods are produced and so on and so on. And I'm having conferences everywhere to explain to any middle scale or big company, smaller company can do much more than the big one, I will tell you after, if I may, uh, how to get people to answer why they develop a product, any services, whatever, how, under what circumstances, 
and where you can trace it. This is the rest of my life I'm going to spend for those, uh, this idea of I want to know what I buy, I want to know what I eat, I want to know what I, uh, I produce. We, do, we know nothing. We know nothing about everything, ladies and gentlemen. And this is a topic we can take. I'm over, and I keep my, my credit card. Merci, Klaus. Next. Thank you. Uh, that's a good, uh, good example of three minutes. Can I ask Claude Wilt uh, to be the, make the next intervention? Because uh, Switzerland has already played a special role. And uh, so, Claude, what's your introduction to the discussion? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I have a few messages. Uh, I hope I can tell, uh, I can speak all about all of them. If not, uh, my government is rich. So, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, first, uh, a remark about, uh, a first message about Swiss foreign policy. As a Swiss state, it, it is in our fo foreign policy that we have a responsibility to protect human rights and to prevent armed conflict. This responsibility derives directly from our constitution. Article 54, Alinea 2, uh, defining the priorities of the foreign policy. Um, and uh, if we want to do this effectively, this we have recognized, uh, in the globalized world of the 21st century, we cannot do it alone as a government. It implies partnerships with private actors like companies and partnerships with the civil societies. It is in recognition of what you've said that public governance cannot mean global governance, has to do more. We have recognized that, we have no problem with it. We have to now find ways to engineer it. And the guiding principle is a perfect tool just for that. A second message about the notion of responsibility. In tonight's event, we're focusing on the relation between states and private companies in order to minimize negative externalities, respect human rights, and maximize positive externalities on human societies and environment of what are legal and legitimate business activities of companies. So it's quite a challenge. In short, we want to ensure that business activities especially in fragile, sensitive, or developing countries, are responsible activities. Now, the big challenge is, what is responsible? What, is, what do we mean by responsible? It's the key word for me in the whole challenge. Uh, what is responsible business? Who defines it, this concept? What is the formula? How much transparency? How much due diligence? How much social impact assessment? Uh, how much anti-corruption and how? What to do about the supply chain? Um, what types of human rights should be prioritized? Because we cannot address them all. Uh, you have different types of human rights. So this is really the challenge that we should always have in mind uh, while speaking this evening. It's really a matter of engineering, and that's what I like about John Ruggie's proposal. We are very good at normative, uh, here also in the university. I've done my studies here in the institute. We are very good at studying the norms. We, are, we, we now, in the 21st century, have to meet the challenge how to implement the norms. I'll stop here. Please make the first 1,000 Swiss francs for amnesty. <laughs> and. Uh, <coughs> Matthias Leisinger, if you hear what uh, Robin Cornelius has said and if you hear what uh, Claude Wilt has said, what uh, is your contribution from Kuoni, from a travel organization? I, be I believe from, from, a, from a private sector point of view, I think what, what we can do as a, as a Swiss company is certainly leading by example and, and operationalize the, the guiding principles. So I'm trying to give you some practical insights on how we as a travel and tourism company are implementing uh, the due, due diligence process in our business. And I think what is important from, from my perspective is uh, we are talking a lot about risks uh, when we talk about human rights. And uh, 
from, from a business point of view, also from a travel and tourism sector point of view, I think what is important is also highlighting the opportunities. So when we go out and talk to our peers, uh, it's not only about talking about human rights risks and violations, uh, especially in the travel and tourism sector, we can also uh, talk about opportunities. And I think this is extremely important. So for example, in the travel and tourism sector, if the employees in a hotel or in a, uh, in, in a destination, they get a decent salary, have good for, and fair working conditions, actually this is directly linked then obviously to, to also to the quality of the product because if you have a better working environment, uh, we, we obviously see that you're willing to, to deliver a better service. So this is directly linked then to, to the quality of our product. So we are working with, with, uh, with industry peers. We have work, been working similar as the Swiss banks do in a round table on human rights and business, especially for the travel and tourism sector, sharing best practices. We are active also in, in, in implementing uh, the UN Global Compact, sharing experience in the UN Global Compact Network here in Switzerland. So I think this is extremely important uh, that, that we share those experience. We have gained through our uh, impact assessments we have been conducting in, in Kenya uh, and, and in India. So I think and I believe that, that uh, having this experience and, and sharing this best practice, this is what we as a business can do here in Switzerland. through your mind if you hear these statements? When we are speaking here, I get the impression that everything is okay. But in fact, we are speaking here, or we have the United Nations guiding principles, because human rights abuses are happening by companies, and because companies face human rights risks. In Switzerland, a large alliance of civil society organizations will launch an initiative, a constitutional initiative in April or May. We try to, to strengthen one pillar of John Rocky's smart mix. He proposes in this United Nations guidelines a smart mix of voluntary measures being taken by the companies themselves and of mandatory measures being ta taken by the state. We want that in Swiss company law, that Swiss company law forces companies to introduce systems, processes of due diligence for observing and respecting human rights. So it's a very minor issue somehow. We don't uh, treat in this initiative the topic of remedy, which is much more controversial with the business groups here in Switzerland. I may say a little bit what is the reaction. Uh, the Swiss business associations tell us, my goodness, one can't legislate nationally about these things. They say you need an international binding treaty if you would like these things. Uh, John Hockey has criticized the reality or possibility of such an international treaty. And in fact, it has been tried before the United Nations guiding principles have been made. And there, all the business associations, also the Swiss Bond, have been against. So in fact, the organized business tells us we don't like that. Individually, there are big companies in Switzerland, we tell them we want to change that and make it a legal prescription. What do you say? They say, we already have processes for human rights diligence. We could do it easily, but we will not be able to pronounce publicly that we favor that. Thank you, 
So uh, our, our association, the, the Swiss Trading and Shipping Association, has welcomed the approach that has been chosen by the Swiss uh, government to build a multi-stakeholder di uh, dialogue to implement the RUGI principle, and this unconditionally in Switzerland. And that because we see in it uh, an opportunity to learn from the process, uh, but also to know and show that we respect human rights in our business. And as said before by Professor Ruggie, uh, there is still very little known about our industry in the public in general, and that's also a great opportunity to change that. Uh, our association and uh, our members, among which there, there are a majority of small and medium companies that has been left in the, uh, a little bit uh, today uh, in this discussion, are convinced that it is in the commodity trading industry best interest to create a, a sustainable uh, supply chain and good business environment. And uh, it is an inherent part of the company strategy to reduce risk, uncertainties and unpredictability. And uh, that's also what you mentioned, Professor Ruggie, before, uh, is that uh, it is part of the uh, company's risk management. So that's why we see in the UN guiding principle an opportunity to participate in the development of a, an effective guidance for business on how to respect human rights throughout their operation. So we are convinced that such guidance will help uh, our industry in first preventing and mitigating human, risk rela uh, human rights uh, related risk, and two, provide the industry with practical information on a range of issues, including how to use its influence in support of positive human rights outcomes, and how NGOs and states could help in this regard. So as I just have three minutes, I will stop here. OK, thank, thank you. you very much, <coughs> Stefan. OK, if I, may, if I may make a conclusion here. First one, obviously, everybody is of the opinion this is a good idea. And in principle, we all agree. Now, there's a, a, an, a, an American philosopher called Michael Walzer. And he says there is a difference between thin and thick. Thin is, if you say, talk about human rights or freedom or justice, everybody, that's motherhood and apple pie, everybody agrees. But if you put it into a specific context, if you make it, uh, bring it down to the ground, make it thick, so to say, then the disagreement starts again. So having uh, said uh, mandatory smart mix, Lord Wild, where is the smart mix of Switzerland? You know, how much mandatory, how much voluntary? Thank you. Um, the, the first smart thing to do was to put uh, a multi-stakeholder initiative together in order to approach this. And I think we are on the way to succeed here. Uh, we have several processes that have started in Switzerland. One of these is the Swiss implementation of the Ruggie principle, generally, for Switzerland. It's a process. And another process is what type of a Ruggie-inspired guiding principle could we, together, in a multi-stakeholder approach, uh, create for the uh, Switzerland's commodity industry? Um, because uh, we also feel, as the industry does, uh, and as certainly the NGO does, uh, we feel that there is a need here. Now the difference maybe between the Swiss government and the, the NGO coalition is that we think, again here it's more uh, the engineer of human, of human rights that is speaking, I'm interested in fast results on the ground. I'm not interested in 10 years in parliament with no guarantee of having then a law, but we will have a le legislative process that will go on for quite some time, I can assure you, because the subject is complex. What will we have achieved for progress of human rights on the ground meanwhile? So um, I more believe in convincing through a participative way the industry to produce the responsible business plan 
for operating in sensitive areas. Because once they have this business plan, the effect is here. Whether we have a binding instrument or not, what is important is to have new, new rules of the game. And why multi-stakeholder? Again, it is your model of polycentric government, governance that we want to apply also on the micro scale. Multi-stakeholder product will be a product where we will have consensus, government, NGO, and industry. For that, the first step is to get to know each other. And as we are doing now with the commodity industry, we discover this industry. We go with them on the ground. We see what they are doing in order to then put the right recommendation for them. Because if we legislate, if we legislate top down, uh, we will sure miss the target. Uh, that is, is bad engineering. So good engineering is participative way. Thank you, Claude. Now, Robin, you must be very impatient if you hear this. If you were made in charge of Robin Cornelius implements the Rocky principles in Switzerland, what would be the first three steps you take? Okay. I'm very impatient. First of all, imagine the, the life, active life starts from very early in the morning until night. For me, it's 5.30. For you, it's apero time, one hour more, let's say. And the youngsters, they have, imagine one year, no, one hour of the day is four years active life. So we have no time. So you're right, because you're legislating for years and years, but you, you have a problem, you have to find the target. I mean, it, well, you know what the target is, stakeholder? is those guys. Consumers will become voters. Forget all the rest. To come back for your ruggy, ruggy uh, ideas, if I may, I took some notes. I loved it. When you speak about the public, civil, and corporate the governance and the polycentric. I, do you know André Comte Sponville, a French philosopher? He had a lecture in Paris, 99, and he said, capitalism, is it immoral or the moral? He said, it's just a system. It's, it's amoral, right? So if you have the legal frame fixed, if you have the cash, you and I we can do whatever we want, if it's legal, we have the cash, we will do, without any moral approach. So capitalism is the only way that works. I'm capitalistic. I love so much object. I'm very materialistic. I would like to talk to object. I want to know where it comes from, under what condition. But to come back to what Mr. Ruddy said, interesting, in this poly uh, system, poly uh, centric, just imagine that capitalism, uh, the only way to put a frame on it is to get this moral to the individual moral. When we say when you feel asleep at night with a good or bad conscience, it seems very moralistic, but it works. Who else can control the capitalism? I don't believe you guys in the industry, we have, we have some binding, binding, binding. Bind what? You know how many years I've been doing that? Since 92, 25 years. Everything is done, and we are a small company. But if I may, when, when uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Ruggie said, uh, responsible buyer, Apple, fantastic example. I love that you uh, took it up. I was uh, with a friend there in a board meeting of social accountability, you know, okay, in New York. And on TV at night, there was an activist, pretend to be an activist, a lady, who was in front of an Apple store and said, I love so much my Apple, I want to have a clean Apple. Remember when Conakra and all these low wages, Asian floor divided per five? When the end consumer, when your fans are criticizing yourself, then you come to the point, because all your bigger players, big companies, they have only two problems, or they miss the train, Kodak, uh, I wrote down what Kodak, and um, uh, Kodak is for the day, uh, Nokia, okay, they miss the train. The other risk, there is only one, ladies and gentlemen, reputation risk, you agree? Fine. We were in Zurich with Anthony Bergman. I received the Sam Set Management Award with Anthony Bergman. He came with his plane in Zurich, and we had a dinner together, VIP, and we shared $50,000 for the foundations, yeah? He said, Robin, you, you, I wish I could be in your place. He was one of the two CEOs, remember? You had one CEO in London in there. I said, what do you mean with that? Anthony said, you're a free man. You can implement everything you want to do. In, uh, in five minutes. 
So small companies, we, have, we can have a drink after. A big advantage, if I may say. And very important, this reputation risk, uh, you talk about business and human rights, cannot, you cannot go together. Yes, it's possible. If the business is under the influence of the end users, and if they get the information, they will decide if they go for you or they don't go for you. Consumers will become voters. All the rest, I've been 10 years in social accountability uh, board, uh, and uh, I was uh, even invited with SITS, you remember SITS, with uh, Brabeck and uh, um, Klaus, Klaus, uh, not Kinski, Schwab. We, 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 uh, we were at the uh, Palais des Nations Unies, empty parking, security, four limousines, and one of the limousines was me, 10 years back. They was launching Global Compact. I said, Robin, I had a speech, and I could see Brabeck was listening at me like that, and Klaus, like, eh? and I said, what the hell am I doing here? We want you, we switch you to join Global Compact. And I say, no, because, and I tell you why, because you have big tools for big players, and small tools for smaller players, right? And the code of conduct of Global uh, Compact is not enough stringent regarding the level we put it up with social accountability. It, we, we go far, we went far, much, I, we not go backward, meaning a small company, middle scale, we can do much more, quicker, and show the example to the big players. And you know why? Because we have a hell of an energy, because we are entrepreneurs sometimes, and it doesn't request money. It's very cheap, what, uh, to, to build schools, uh, trays, uh, medical dispensaries, uh, water retreatment plan, peanuts. But you, big players, you, you have to, you know why the, all those big players are doing that? Just to avoid the reputation risk, because you have a problem with reputation, the, the, the pension fund investing millions in your shares, we go down by three points, and you lose money. And they will never do it, and you have to admit it, just for, to save the planet. Because it's normal, it's the investment, investors, they have to get some return. So how can we get the big players, the medium and the small one, to the same table? But getting them to vote for you, you have to agree. Okay. And this is a super topic, we can have a chat afterwards, huh? Yeah? Okay. okay. Thank you. Robin, I love optimists, but I'm not so sure. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, Stefan, uh, with Robin, it seems easy, you know, if you, if you buy something where you have a clear affinity, here is the producer, here is the customer, you can hope that you have uh, value-driven customers who have an emotional value, not only a financial value as well. But with a shipping and, and trading company, you know, who is your customer? You don't have a direct one. Uh, where, uh, who can then decide, no, in future, I'm not using this trading company because they don't look for human rights in business. Yeah, so it's clear that there are, there are uh, real challenges. And uh, I, I would like just to, to, to say that on what was said before, uh, we have seen that uh, in the consumer market, the, the, the companies that are more closer to consumer market, like coffee or uh, chocolate, cocoa, that's where we see the, the, the most innovative uh, initiatives, just because there is a direct link with the customer. And it seems that the customer is pressure, uh, pressuring the supply chain much more than in other commodities. So the, the importance of the customer is a, is a real one. But I, I'm, I have to say that in the commodity sector, the difficulty is really to break it down into the different uh, activities. Uh, they are sourcing, storing, blending, delivering, uh, asset management. So all these different activities are linked to different risk. And that's why uh, the, the first thing we have really to do is to have a clear understanding uh, and a clear mapping of this risk and uh, what, what it is exactly and where is there something that we can leverage. Because I, I think that's also something very important and that's what 
very positive in the, in the approach of uh, the Regis principle is that we can really bring this diversity of skills and resources uh, involved in the discussion, in the multi-stakeholder dialogue, and create first a better mutual under understanding of the difference uh, activity, their risk, the leverage point, and help, then helps to, to find a consensus around it to, to improve the situation and identify the impacts, as it was uh, explained before. Okay, John, you have heard to, to you have listened to these different statements. What would be your intuitive reaction? You know, it's what I have heard so far was pretty general. And what I have heard so far, yes, in principle, this is a good thing. But then I have not heard tomorrow morning I'm going to do this or that differently than what I did uh, before the Rocky principles were available. What is your comment on that? Well, you should ask them why. <laughs> I, I wanted you to say, Klaus, you are so right. I mean. <laughs> Um, Klaus, uh, the, the longer that I work in this area, the more um, difficult I find it to make um, really, really big generalizations um, because um, different industry sectors have such different challenges um, and different approaches. Um, someone mentioned that um, um, I had focused um, heavily on sort of the accountability dimension. That was because that was my mandate. I didn't have any choice. but I. I think of, of a company, and again, let me use a, a non-Swiss company um, as an example of, of Unilever, where the CEO, um, and I'm, I'm sort of exaggerating here to make a point, but he sort of fell out of bed one morning and said, you know, um, we and Nestle and Procter and Gamble, we all compete for a, a market share in a global market of two billion people. But there are eight and a half billion people in the world. How do we reach the others, and we don't reach them with our current business model. We actually need to develop new and different business models. And, and, you, and, and that's an op that there, there is an opportunity. Uh, how do you go from two to four without, at the same time, um, um, increasing your environmental footprint? That is a, an absolute pledge that they have made and that they're measuring. So the opportunity side of this is important. I didn't talk about it enough because that wasn't my, 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 my mandate. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, also say that um, uh, the, the guiding principles, I didn't stress this enough, the guiding principles are no longer simply CSR. Right? They're not the Global Compact. They're different from the Global Compact. The Global Compact um, the purpose of the Global Compact was to, quote, sort of normalize the corporate responsibility discourse, to, to make it less strange to business, especially when it comes to human rights. Um, so that, oh, that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, the, guiding principle, the, the, the guiding principles do several things that the Global Compact doesn't do. First of all, it addresses the duties of governments, which the Global Compact doesn't do. Secondly, uh, it addresses questions of remedy, which the Global Compact doesn't do. And thirdly, it addresses the question of law and lawmaking, which the Global Compact doesn't do. So we actually, when you step back and look at it, there has been an evolution in 15 years. 15 years ago, we were, we were doing Global Compact 101. Uh, these days, um, we're, we're, doing, we're, doing, we're doing much more, um, and it hasn't... It, 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 it hasn't caused the sky to fall. I mean, people are sitting around saying, oh, okay, that makes sense. Now, not enough people are saying it, and they're not saying it fast enough. Uh -huh. But, you know, when, when you're a company that operates in 200 countries and territories, as, you know, many multinationals do, you don't, it, it's like a big ship. You don't turn it around overnight. Uh -huh. Um, and tone at the top matters. Yes. Um, incentive structures matter. Um, and what, what you've called engineering, in a sense, matters. How do you, how do you tr if, if, if you're a global company that operates in 200 territories, how do you translate these things into something that a local manager, you know, can pull out of a pocket and say, oh, this is what I'm now supposed to do? Um, that, that, that's hard. And it takes time. Uh, and, and, and so um, my, 
I'm, I'm I, I, as an academic, you know, I, I made my career on making generalizations. Right? Um, that's what we do as academics. Um, but the closer I come to this, we've established a sort of a common floor is, is sort of the way I think about it. But moving beyond this floor requires far greater specificity with regard to particular industry sectors, sizes of companies, places of operation, um, and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, Matthias Leising, um, uh, one of the, what, what uh, uh, Robin Cornelius said is that, you know, at the end, the enlightened customers will make their choice, allocate their purchasing power according to normative issues, you know, to values that are uh, independent from the product. Are your customers paying the extra dollar or the extra Swiss francs if and when you would make an extra effort for human rights compliance? Yeah, that's a tough question. I noted actually down the, the, the customer pressure, pressure with a big question mark. So uh, uh, I believe that, I mean, what we can serve, observe in the travel and tourism sector is that probably a customer would not enter a, a retail store and ask for a uh, sustainable products or, or a very minimum uh, amount of customers would do so. But what, what we see is that the customer expects from um, large companies as ours, as strong brands, that we uh, treat society and the environment with some fairness. So it's, it's, a, it's a general expectations of, I would say, society towards, towards companies nowadays that they implement certain human rights standards, that they protect the environment um, within their sphere of influence. So I think there's, there's certainly an, an expectation of customers to, to protect society uh, and communities, especially in the travel and tourism sector, because we send them to those countries. They want to experience the, the, the beaches, the, the coral reefs, they want to uh, uh, exchange with local communities, uh, having an, an authentic experience. So I think this is really adding value. And, and I, I believe that, that having a, a human rights due diligence process, and uh, I think also for our company, I mean, the UN guiding principle, principles, they really helped us a lot in, in having a more systematic and, 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 and uh, kind of straightforward approach towards human rights. Uh, it is improving at the end, it is improving the quality of the product. And if you can sell a better quality product, that actually is, is part of the business case. And I think uh, making a strong business case internally then also helps to, to leverage actually discussion internally, which is, which is a major challenge. When our contractors, they go out, they have to bargain for the best deals, they have to renegotiate prices, they have to buy the, the rooms at the cheapest rates, and at the same time we are asking uh, for fair salaries, for overtime being paid. So there's a lot of work we have to do internally, but at the end it is really improving the quality of the product. Mm -hmm. Peter, Nickley. Let me challenge you. What I hear out of here is uh, there is a business case in not violating human rights. I mean, how far are we degenerated as a generation that it has to pay off that you are not violating other people's human rights and dignity? If we see that we do since 20 years, voluntary measures for implementing human rights into the companies. And if we see how many companies don't do that, and how many companies can continue to abuse human rights in certain circumstances, then uh, I, I say many businesses still think perhaps we are lucky enough. Perhaps we can reduce a little bit our efforts in this regard. When we speak with CSR people in the companies, what do they tell? Ah, oh, now we had the change of the CEO. The importance of our business has been reduced. Suddenly, there are these kind of changes. When we spoke to some of the CSR people and said, we want to have a legal obligation that companies establish a due diligence process, they said, that would be fine. So such kind of changes couldn't happen again. So that is what we try to achieve now. 
we acknowledge very much that all the efforts of introducing voluntary systems, all the experiences helped to really do it. If you have such a law, then a company has to, to uh, concretize internally. For that, for this you have today a huge experience and you can do it. So that was very valuable, but it didn't go enough far and it's too much subjected to the individual uh, policies of company bosses who don't always think about human rights. So before I give the... Uh... Can I... Yes, please. Just jump in on that. Yes. If I, if I, just if I may, just very briefly. Do you do anything with this? No. Yeah. Um, human rights um, isn't something that, for those of us who are committed to human rights, isn't something that should require a business case. It should be done because it's the right thing to do. But that doesn't mean that you don't pay attention to business cases when they're sitting right in front of you. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, um, having, having studied um, as part of my mandate um, a number of sort of classic industries that kept running into trouble, um, one of them was the extractive industry. Um, and I, I, re I related an example before uh, about uh, a Peruvian um, mining operation. Uh, I remember asking um, the CEO of, of one of the major um, uh, oil companies, I said, look, um, Goldman Sachs has reported that um, it now takes almost 10 years longer for you from the time you start exploring to the time you actually get a drop of oil out of the ground. And that most of that has nothing to do with financial risk or with geological risk. It has to do with community pushback. The, the, the amount of time it requires to get mandates, keeping communities happy, and so on and so forth. He said, and, I, and I asked a very simple question. I said, what does that cost you? And he said, we have no idea. And so I said, wouldn't it be worth finding, finding out? And he said, yeah, I guess. Um, and they hired a consulting firm. Um, they spent a little over a year, turned over all of the documentation, and they came back with a range of estimates of how much money it cost them. The middle of the range, not the high, was $6.5 billion over a two-year period. $6.5 billion they left on the table because of community-related, if you, if you will, risk. Mm. And I said, look, you know, I, I live on an academic salary. Is it, I don't know about these things. Is that a big number? <laughs> you know? and, and, and I was told, yeah, yeah, you know, even in the oil industry, that's a big number. I said, well, how could you have missed it? Yeah. He says, because we roll it into local operating costs. We never, we never separate it out and aggregate it globally as a specific cost. Once you say that to them, obviously they do, and that gives that changes the, the dynamics of decision-making yeah. inside the company. Yeah. So you yeah. wouldn't want to ignore business cases when, when they're sort of low-hanging fruit like that. Of course, of course. What I meant is uh, if it, if, even if it did not have a business case, it's the right, right thing to do. So let me open up to the public. Are there questions? Yes, there are. Please make it short. Please don't have a second introduction. We want to have as many as possible. First, this gentleman, and then I take three women in a row just to compensate. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Ruggi, um, I'm Gabriel can, Minder. Can you from quickly introduce yourself? Rotary, Ro My name is Gabriel Minder from Rotary International Geneva. Mm -hmm. I have a very specific and simple question to you. You have made a very good point of your principles. Now, for practical purposes, very, very practical, we are an association of one and a half million people in 34,000 clubs which do what they want. How do we knock uh, principles into them? Well, I'll tell you what we did. One thing was what you mentioned, but only China seems to have appeared on your face. This is ISO 26,000. 
ISO 26000 was born here in Geneva four years ago. It was revived here, revised two years ago. It is usable. It costs $100 for 100 pages, and you use only 10 pages because the rest is not interesting for everybody. And it is not a, it is not a standard. It is a guiding principle. So you are free, very, very free. Nestle did that same thing, did it differently. It's one thing. My second question is Harvard. Harvard invented something in 2005, I think. Two of your professors' names, unfortunately, escaped to my memory. But it was called shared value. OK? Now, shared value was taken up by General Electric, taken up by IBM. But the only one whom we saw here in this lake region was Nestle, who, cre who had something called creating shared value. We found that this is something interesting. Because we are full of people who are business and government, who are benevolent and earn money. We have everything. So we have to adapt it. Now, how come that you don't tell people, these, with these two, you can be happy? You don't have to, uh, to study uh, principles and theory, because this has been done. It took 10 years to create ISO 26000. Thank you. John, I, I'm collecting questions. And by the way, that was not what I meant with a short question. Please. please. Yeah. No, no, here. That lady first, please. And then the lady in the back. No, this first. Down. No, what, what, down. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rage, for an interesting lecture. Um, quick question. I understand that a lot of national action plans are being developed to implement the guiding principles, um, including in the US and Finland, which is my country. Um, but I also understand that a lot of these plans are just a two-pager about what the country is already doing, and they're not really identifying where more work needs to be done. Can you comment on the value of these national action plans, please? Thank okay, you. Thank you. And the lady behind that, yes? Thank you very much. My name is Patty Rundle. I'm from an organization called IPFAN. And we have been sort of um, on the tail of all the big transnational companies like Nestle and others and their baby food marketing, which is well known to be, you know, an ongoing problem. Uh, what I want to ask is this, this whole conception and someone on the panel, I think it was you, Dr. Ruggie, about actually the business of malnutrition, the Unilever idea to actually go out to the developing world with a different model. Now, we're seeing that as a huge threat because they are involving all other NGOs into a whole sort of idea that this creating shared value and getting together with corporations is the way forward for NGOs. I think this is a huge threat and it is actually using the developing countries just to build mar markets for, de for big companies here in, in the north. And so the independent monitoring that we do gets sidelined. And the more you have these multi-stakeholder things, the, more, the less likely you are to get really true monitoring of what companies do, and the more likely they are to be able to be powerful and, and influence governments and not get the laws that we need. Okay, thank you. Peter, I would expect you to address that issue as well. Other questions from the floor, please? Hello, Mary Mine Fish Business School, Lausanne. I have more of a statement to make rather than a, a question. If and it is short, it's fine. Very short, yeah. It's really in relation to the principles of responsible management education and the fact that we haven't really talked about education in this discussion. And I think um, I'm in a business school, but we have not approached the law schools, the engineering schools, the project management schools, and all those schools who are actually responsible uh, for the education of young people. And I don't think it's companies that actually um, abuse. I think it's people. And I think if we don't start educating very, very broadly and have transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary uh, education systems in place, we're not going to bring about the changes we need. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, can we move the microphone over that side? Because that so far have been not looked upon. Yes. <coughs> And if I don't see you, make noise and stand up because the light is shining here. 
Okay, yes. thank you. My name is Vera Lalchevska, and I'm a PhD candidate in development studies here at the Graduate Institutes. Um, and um, I had a question for uh, Professor John Ruggi. I hate to put you on the spot, but um, I have a question <laughs> regarding... <laughs> No, my question is regarding unpaid internships at the UN, and um, uh, okay. Thank <laughs> which you I so have much. been five times an, in, an unpaid intern at the UN, and thanks to the gentleman from Rotary, I, I was able to do my studies. But putting aside the fact that the UN is not a business, has anyone out there measured the impact and severity of unpaid internships in the UN of equal employment opportunities? And I'm speaking of people who come from poor countries because the UN is a huge employer. Yeah. Only in Geneva, there is over 10,000 people in different, in various UN agencies. So has anyone measured the impact? And if not, would you like to hire me? <laughs> to... My name is Daniel Gostelli. I'm from the Swiss section of Amnesty International. Unfortunately, you the money, yes. I won't get back uh, tonight with a lot of money, but uh, I'm very happy to be there. Um, I just have a question. I've been working for a long, long time on business and human rights, and I'm not a lawyer, but I was just wondering, why is the word law such a taboo? Um, thinking about the human rights due diligence, such an important cornerstone of your framework, Mr. Uh, Professor John Ruggi, um, I think it's a cornerstone because if we can embed this in law, we can prevent abuses. So the third pillar actually wouldn't be necessary and I wouldn't see any more people coming to me and saying I've been raped for 10 years and there are so many people like in Bhopal uh, waiting for so, such a long time to, to get remediation. So why is it such a taboo? We noted that companies in Switzerland are doing well to put this into law and have a living playing field. Thank you. So let's make a, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, one, more, one last one question and then I make a round of answers and then we go to the second round. Please, the lady here in front. My name is Giselle Ruffer. I am Swiss, I am a woman, and I am an entrepreneur. And I agree with uh, Mr. Robin Cornelius that small entrepreneurs uh, can take decisions and make things in a new way. But it is very difficult in Switzerland to be a woman, to be an entrepreneur, and to find help from... Uh, the Swiss uh, from any way, and it's also very difficult to fight against big, co big company. And what do I do? I do watches for women. That means that it is now time for women. <laughs> so what can we do for women entrepreneurs? Okay. Now, can I ask for a round of answers? John, will you start, and then Claude, and then Robin, and then Matthias, Peter, and Stefan? Um, Sure, I, I can't, um, I, I, I'm not qualified to answer all of them. Um, no, 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 just what you just, find. Is, is um, especially the one about UN as employers. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of my first jobs when I joined Kofi Annan back in 1997 was to write the annual report of, on, on the work of the organization which the Secretary General is required to present uh, to the General Assembly every year. And one of the things I've, I wanted to look into is the, how the UN goes about hiring people and how long it takes to hire somebody. And I believe the answer was an average of 371 days. <laughs> and uh, I said, I don't think I want to know anything more about this system. Um, it's not, it, it's, it's got to be somebody else's responsibility. I'm a strategic planner, um, not, not, not a human resources person. Um, and when I put my, my, the team for my mandate together, uh, it, w it proved impossible to hire the people inside the UN. So I hired them all as research associates at Harvard. So the entire UN team, which was multinational, became research associates at Harvard <laughs> and got paid by Harvard to put the grants that I raised um, from friendly governments um, like Switzerland, thank you. Um, <laughs> So um, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on that question. Um, so I'll pass on that. ISO 26000, um, extremely important. Um, I, I put a full-time person on ISO 26000 to make sure 
that the human rights part of it was closely aligned with what we were doing. Um, and, and you probably know better than I do, it was actually a big fight inside of ISO. Um, but in the end, um, uh, we prevailed. I was really interested in ISO uh, because, it, uh, among other reasons, because it has such a, a big uptake in Asia. Um, and I guess that has to do with the Japanese quality management standard that, uh, that originated as an ISO standard and so on and so forth. So I'm with you um, um, on that one completely. Um, on the national action plans, um, there aren't that many yet, um, and they vary in quality. Um, um, the U.S. has, has agreed to do one, uh, and I, I, in, a, in, a, in a moment of uh, um, intemperance, um, I said that the best thing that will come out of the U.S. plan is that various parts of the U.S. government will actually be required to talk to each other. <laughs> um, which is not to be discounted, um, but um, the British plan, the, the British uh, plan wasn't bad. It had new things in it that, was, that weren't there before. Uh, and I look, very much look forward to the Swiss plan um, when it comes. Okay, thank you, John. Um, <laughs> law, school, law schools, business schools, law schools, the uptake of this in law schools has been enormous. Um, in fact, much more so, um, I've, as a political scientist, I, I, I find it interesting that, that uh, there are far more references to the work that, that, that we've done in law journals than in, um, in, in political science journals. Um, why is law taboo? It's not, um, not for me. Um, law is, a, it is, is an instrument by which society um, governs um, itself. Um, it, 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 my, my, my only resistance has been to trying to, as I said before, include the entire humongous a complex universe of business and human rights into a single treaty instrument because I think that would be utterly meaningless. Uh, thank you. Very quickly on, U uh, on national action plans. Um, yes, it took a little bit, bit more time in Switzerland. You will be ready in June. Uh, it's a multi ministerial exercise in Switzerland. So um, it's not so easy huh? because uh, education, which is very important, has also uh, goes with you, human rights mainstreaming within the government and to to making to everybody understand that human rights is not something visionary, utopist, but it's the key to uh, progress of mankind. Huh? It's the key to progress to mankind. You cannot have security, you cannot have development if you don't have a good human rights standard first. And it goes transversal across all government activities. All government activities. There's no hierarchy between trade uh, uh, and human rights. It's trade with human rights. And we are in the process of getting this mainstreaming done. What we don't want is a UN action plan of Switzerland of two pages that only ask for, for uh, reporting. Uh, we want to say how to report, on what to report, and we want to be able to break down for each sector of the industry, because it's complex. So we cannot have a plan that is valid for everybody. It's a plan that gives guidance then for other plans for each sector. And while we are working on the main plan, we are already working also on a specific plan for a commodity industry. Um, maybe just one thing on law. It, it's not taboo, but it's slow. Law is slow. Uh, and and uh, I'm not interesting. We, as you said, we don't have time. We have to change now. And I'm confident that the legal part of the Swiss uh, business and human rights uh, legislation will come through the outside as several times in our history. So while this will, why? Because all our multinationals or international active corporation, they have assets in the EU and in the US and they will have to follow. So while this is preparing, we are working on the engineering part, which is the voluntary part. And Peter, it's not the past voluntary is a new voluntary under the new paradigm, which is a smart voluntary, 
which, is, which means it's multi-stakeholder, it's guided by the state, and now, thank God, we have a mandate for doing, doing that. We do business diplomacy in the human rights uh, division. Very new, since the Reggae Principle. So the Reggae Principle has impacted. Yeah? There is a new way of doing diplomacy uh, to, to address the polycentric uh, reality of the world. Voilà. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good news for you, there is a new way of doing business. A new what? Of doing business. There is other way to do businesses now, emotionally. So, no, I mean, it's good what you say, but emotion. You know what you said? You ask me first, if I may say, Klaus, what would you do, what would you do tomorrow? Okay? I will be very short and very clear. And you said, Raggy, uh, Professor, Yag oh, sorry, uh, uh, Professor uh, Raggy, uh, is full of respect, please. Uh, uh, you said, pre-centric governance, fine. You know what is missing? What that lady over there said about the business school in Lausanne? Education. But you know who we have to educate? The CEO, the CFO, the COO, all the O. We have deflate their egos, deflate their egos, and get them on the field to be troopers. Creativity doesn't require money, just thoughts, thinking. Like uh, um, the, the best example, I'm talking about traceability. I'm supposed to talk about that. I would trace tomorrow morning everything. You know what we do with Gilles and a bunch of guys? 45 million pieces are traced by us in uh, 10 years now. We're tracing garments, we're tracing plastic bags for micro made of, uh, how you call that, um, corn. We can try to feel millions of bags. We're going to trace coffee very soon. We're going to trace a lot of activity for piece of the um, home furniture. You know what? I'm sure you agree, because you, great uh, academician, you know what you need? And I swear, a trooper. I'm a trooper. You guide me, and I show you, let's go, fast lane, fast lane. You understand what I mean? Yeah. You agree? So I got an intern and a trooper. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you, you have a, no, you have both. Just put everything on line. When you put them on, you ask on the supply chain from a, a complicated one or maybe five or six steps. Every stakeholder, every actor has to, to, to give all the information, what he's doing, the wage, how much he pays, and all the social conditions, wrap, security, and so. And we put them online. It's free. The, 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 the product won't cost more because everybody has to participate to put them. When you put everything online, you know what's happening? If something shit happens, huh? child labor there, uh, health and safety not for, oh, thank you, we will take an immediate step because it's online. You cannot have any bribing online. How many cages you bought of cotton or whatever, you sold to him, okay, prove me, and you can trace it. So you, you cannot be bribing because you have the price. Show your margins. Show how much profit you make in public auctions. When you buy this, if it's public, uh, I hope it's a good buy. Uh, not a good buy, I mean uh, a, a, a good buy, yeah? Because uh, how do they do in the public, with your public budgets? They say, I have a cheap, an expensive, and a middle-sized offer, I mean, in price ranking. And I don't want to have a problem as a buyer, so I take the middle size. Huh? I want to know everything, what margin they take, how the logistics is done. We open all our margins. At the end of the day, all the companies try to make 5%, 3%, except bankers, they want to make 15 But the rest, 5% profit. If we remove our pants, what will be the difference? Maybe a centimeter or two. So, so please help me to get people to trace to open up, and the CEOs have to go back, and, and you take, and I finish with this, I promise, Klaus, I promise, I promise. <laughs> if you take from 100, uh, 100 francs turnover, whatever, 50% margin, good margin textile, remain with 50, 25% removed for building, wages, whatever, 10% for whatever, and you have uh, five, six, 10% marketing, and 5% profit, right? move from the marketing budget, from the marketing guy with big ego, remove some points from his budget, and put them in soft values. Tracking, uh, teaching, helping, giving back. With Gilles, is giving back one, we give 1% of, uh, uh, we should go and pay directly, directly the workers in, in the factories. Because the guy, the factory man cannot. He has his budget. We pay back. And this is an immense effect in terms of marketing. 
because marketing is important. So just stop the ego. I'm sure we're going to have to have a gin after that. Thank you. Okay, Klaus, I'm Thank over. You hand it on. <laughs> Yeah, I just want to quickly go um, go back to uh, the question uh, on, on law and level playing field. I think what what uh, from from a company internal perspective, what certainly was one of the big things that uh, Professor Ruggie did was using the term of due diligence because it was uh, a term that is used within companies uh, very often when you do uh, merchant acquisition. So it's a very familiar term to a lot of, of uh, departments internally. So using the term of due diligence actually is extremely helpful because as we have seen and discussed, I mean, it's not necessarily the function of uh, the role of a CSR function within within a business to, to ensure human rights uh, due diligence. It is actually uh, a cross-functional responsibility. So working with internal audit, supply chain management, human resources, uh, the, the C-levels, uh, educating them, leveraging uh, human rights policies. I think this is really important. I think what, what in, at least in the travel and tourism sector, what is probably the term that makes a lot of, of C-level executives more, more threatening is the term human rights. It's not necessarily the term law, because in, in the past, and I think that was also Professor Roggi outlined, there was actually not, not the dialogue, it was rather conflict between NGOs and, and the private sector saying, look, there are human rights violations, don't travel to China, don't travel to Myanmar because there are uh, human rights violations in these in this respective countries. So it was more a confrontation. Now what, certainly one of the big achievements is that we have moved away from this shaming or blaming game into more kind of a transparent, multi-stakeholder dialogue. I think this is what, what changed uh, substantially over the last uh, few years. I want to make two remarks, which answer perhaps to your question. One was this uh, example of Procter & Gamble, which cares about of having actually only two billions of customers and things and five billions are left out. Shouldn't we develop something to help them? I think that's quite a stupid question of Procter and Campbell. First answer could be there are other companies who care for the other customers. Second one, there are developing countries who have an interest to promote their own companies who can produce products like Procter & Campbell. Third and final questions, why are five billion not able to buy Procter & Campbell? Because they don't have the money. They don't have the money. And they have all the more necessary things to buy, food. So the whole development of markets for the poor by multinationals from rich countries is, in my view, a very strange thing. But they are trying it, and naturally they will, perhaps in certain countries, open a market for themselves. Second uh, remark I want to make is concerning multi-stakeholder processes. Claude Wild will, uh, Claude will wants now us to multi-stakeholder everywhere. It is very nice to be multi-stakeholder with Claude Wild. But what is the political purpose of it? Actually, we have a government which is uh, decisive about we only want to push the voluntary side of the Rocky Guidelines. But they would like to have the NGOs in multi-stakeholder arrangements to say also the opposition is favoring our approach. That makes it a little bit difficult for us. Nobody is against staying together with companies and businesses and speaking about the, the concrete points of how to implement due diligence or things like that. But we don't like to be instrumentalized presently by the Swiss government where, which is willing only to do a little bit. You are a little bit also an exception. You are the only 
civil servant who somehow fights gladly in this context. Others are taking you back. So that is our reserve for the time being for this kind of multi-stakeholder exercises here in Switzerland, because we can make a step further. But in concrete circumstances, even members of the Alliance are involved in many places in smaller multi-stakeholder approaches concerning business and human rights. Yes, so to, to the question of the regulation, I see we, we, don't, we should not see reggae as an alternative to legislation. The only thing, as it was stated, is that uh, we, we need today to support companies to uh, succeed in identification, mitigation, and remedy. And that can be done only with the support of NGOs and, and states. It cannot be done alone uh, by companies. And uh, this... Uh, uh, is driving the cooperation and the sharing of information between companies, NGOs, and states on the ground and give all, also all its sense to the multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, and this approach is also part of uh, a Swiss expertise. Uh, and if we want to succeed and have a real result, I don't think, and I, I, I join uh, Ambassador Vild on that, uh, that we have, we, we, we have to wait on the, uh, on the normative uh, approach because it will never be able to really uh, uh, touch all the details or the granularity necessary to have an improvement on the ground, but we need to facilitate the communication between the stakeholders and with all the stakeholders involved. It is an effective tool to identify uh, the company's adverse human rights impacts and to allow to draw on feedback from internal and external sources. And I think that is really the challenge today, more than uh, elaborating some complicated law that will maybe be applied in 10 years and will not be really relevant for what we want to achieve. Thank you very much, Stefan. Ladies and gentlemen, I do apologize, I'm not taking more questions. We have run over time and I see people running out. Thank you so much, uh, panel, and thank you very much, John Ruggie, for the wisdom you have shared with us. It has been a great experience. Now, before, before you go out, uh, I can invite you that uh, we are honoring the right to food and the right to drink. Uh, there is a cocktail that is thanks to the Globe Diplomatique and uh, thanks to De Puri, Picte and uh, Turetini is offered out there. Uh, I can also tell you that please leave your visiting card out or up there so that we can make a follow-up. And uh, just before I, before I finish, there is one man that I want to especially mention. It is Melchior de Muralt, who is sitting honestly in the back. Who is, who is sitting modestly in the back. It was very much his initiative. It was very much his push uh, that made things happen. And that's true leadership. Thanks a lot, uh, Melchior. And please follow our invitation to the cocktail.